Thursday, September 5th, 2017. And uh, I'm looking for approval of the agenda, uh, but there is a change, uh, and that's in the adoption of the minutes. Uh, we're removing 3.2 because there was a mistake in, in there, and uh, they want to correct it first. Yeah. Be only looking at for adoptions of 3.1. Uh, Council Mackay? I recommend the Council adopt the agenda of the September 5th, 2007 regular meeting of the Council as amended. Seconder? Councilor Shaw? All in favor? Okay, adoption of minutes uh, for August 17th, <coughs> 2017. Special meeting. Council Guy. Uh, council adopt the minutes of August 17th, uh, 2017, special council meeting. All in favor? Any business arising from those minutes? Uh, one correction on page uh, 7, I think it is. Um, if I was present, it was Councilor Kirby that was via phone conference. So that correction could be noted. Anything else? Okay. Move on. Um, this is the delegation. <coughs> First up will be 5.1, the Wolverine Motor and Mount Society, Dr. Dr. Helm, and uh, on the spot. Welcome. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. This was in part in response to a conversation that you and I had where you encouraged us, maybe on a once a year basis, to just show you what the Wolverine Oregon Mountain Society is up to. And then I wanted to give our, our new president, Thomas Clark, the opportunity just to say a few words as president uh, as well. And it seems a good time because we're reaching the end of the trail season. And, uh, um, I know we've got limited time, so I would just like to get into the slideshow. We want to show you the trail projects we've been busy with, and then let um, Mr. Clark speak. Okay. Is it possible to get lines down? Uh, yeah, just here we can. As many as important are there. Briefly, the funding sources for our trails, our major funding source is the Empress Challenge. Um, we've had a total of about 33,000 over four years from the regional district, about 20,000 over four years from BC Parks. Um, Community Forest has uh, supported us a number of times with 5,000 at a time, maybe 10,000 total, I think. And of course, there's the collaboration with the district, so we maintain about 100 kilometers of hiking trails within the geopark. So, regional district funding, the first thing they gave us was for the Babcock Falls Boardwalk, and you can see how we do things with helicopters, volunteers, pull the boardwalks in our backyard, take them out in the truck, fly them in. Next thing, we have boardwalks covering these meadows, which makes it easier for hikers, but also protects the fragile meadows. That, of course, is Babcock Falls in winter, Babcock Falls in summer. And then we actually realized that we put in about 20 meters too short of the boardwalk. There was still a wet area. So we went back this year, didn't use a helicopter, and actually carried all the stuff in by hand this year and built another 20 meters. Uh, also from the regional district, the Windfall Lake, and this is becoming a really big geosite, geopark attraction now. Um, same story, build the boardwalks in the home backyard, get a truck, take them out, put them on a helicopter, fly them in, takes a few hours, next thing. Uh, that took us truly about four hours and we've got a beautiful boardwalk um, to a very sensitive meadow. And this is 2017 group hike, 30 people on the boardwalk, just amazed at uh, you know, how in the middle of the wilderness you've got this beautiful thing. Okay, last year, thanks to Anthony Moreau Coulson's initiative, um, we built these campsites at Windfall Lake. You can see there, that's a Google Earth view with um, showing you where the campsites are. I've got about seven or eight campsites there, again, helicopter, Kids building the campsites, the tent pads for us. Uh, I've got a, a wilderness toilet in their outhouse. 
Um, one or two of them are in the forest for when the weather is really bad. And at the same time, we improved the access trail with bridges and built the circular route in, in order to keep the route away from the sensitive fossil areas and make it more interesting as well. Um, goes right up into the Alpine, as you can see. And then, of course, we put up the signs for protection of caribou and acknowledging regional district support, no fires, all the safety things like that. And this year, we went back to Windfall Lake. There was one very steep area where we had to put up a rope to get people up the cliff. We didn't think that was good enough. We put in these bear caches and a wash, washing, dishwashing area as well. Rerouted some signs and then put in the 76 uh, steps, the staircase of 76 steps. Um, Rerouting the trail so as to avoid the steep rope area. There's the trail builders, and there we have study hikers using the steps. It's already worn in like a highway. Uh, Greg Geoplates, that's uh, this year was also regional district. This enhances the Canusia Falls area. It's about five k's before the falls. There's a three kilometer trail that takes you to two lakes, and it is a memorial recreation area. Last year, we built this dock with the help of Spectra Energy. You can see all the Spectra t shirts there, came and gave us great support. This year, we put one of the Holt benches in at the dock. Beautiful bench that John Holt, our volunteer, makes. There's another one of the Holt benches. And on the second lake, we took down two of these dead pine trees, rolled them around. There's Thomas on his rope on. Um, so we went way under budget with this. We planned for a helicopter. Instead, Thomas with his rope on managed to get everything in, a couple of loads. And uh, next thing, we got everything there, built the stock. So now you can actually fish from the stock. Previously, it was a very hard lake to fish from. And one of the beautiful things here, we got uh, Greg Duke's daughter and her family to come and help us. So we've created that association with uh, the Duke family as well. And uh, so we have two kinds of benches. We have um, old benches, which I showed you before, the more formal benches, and we've got Booker benches, which is the um, Fred Booker is on the right there. And these are just wilderness benches made from lead for which we cut into place, and next thing it's up. So we've got lots of Booker benches on the trail. That's the view from the far end of the uh, Great Duke Lakes Trail. We put signs in there, as you can see, bottom right, the regional district logo there, and we always try and acknowledge our, our funding support. So that's one of the signs that's up there as well. In the shipyard Titanic, we, again, it's become an enormously popular trail, um, iconic for Tunnel Ridge. We only built it about three, four years ago, and it's already like a highway. This is the scenery we go through. The goal is to get right onto the prow of the Titanic, which is the top right corner there. It's become an amazing snowshoe destination. I think it's the finest snowshoe trip in the world. And that's a huge success. And then we've also, as you know, um, this was done in, in uh, collaboration with the District of Tumbler Ridge, this creation of the TR Trail, which is now 28 kilometers long and leads to geosites, um, sites of geological interest fully interpreted all the way. So that's been another big one. There's another book of bench. There's a whole bench. Uh, this is Nathan's Trail, which is the little 500 meter loop which leads from the golf course to this beautiful viewpoint. And we've got plans for this. It's flat, and I'll come to it in a second what we're thinking of doing on this one for next year. Then we had a few wet spots on the Bergeron Falls Trail, so we changed our boardwalk style. This is a lot easier to get in with the rope on, um, doing the boardwalks like this. It's a lot quicker, and it was very successful. You can see Thomas top right with is Rokon again, and there's Thomas at Bergeron Falls, which, as you know, is the highest accessible waterfall in northern BC, and that's in flood Bergeron Creek at the base of the falls. Uh, the other major project recently was in partnership with the Museum Foundation, celebrating, trying to go back to the history in 2000, was the pivotal moment when the kids discovered the dinosaur trackway. It's very hard to see those tracks now, but we um, created a, a viewpoint and put up the sign there. Um, with another whole bench. So you're looking across the creek at where the discovery was made. So it's just completing the loop and showing people where that history began. That takes us back to 2000 and 2001 with uh, Mark and Daniel doing a high five. So Rich and I did a high five just to say it's 2017, we're still here and here's the sign. So then we took uh, Daniel Helm to the sign and showed him this is how it's come full circle and got him to pose beside uh, the sign, which as you can see has got the whole Geopark logo and everything that goes with that. And then I just put this there, Thomas took this photograph, but this is the sign that's covered up. That everyone's wondering what is it, and it's at the Flatbed Falls uh, parking lot, but it's going to be unveiled sometime by Ministry of Transportation, and that's what it says. 
<laughs> so I don't know why there's this confusion and why they've covered it up. At one point, some vandals opened it up and then they covered it up again. So it should be sometime in the next few weeks. And then there's the work in our provincial parks. And this is myself, Thomas, and Brandon, obviously, in Monkland. Um, BC Parks had closed the access trail um, to the viewpoints for the falls. Thomas and I, and Brandon, took up 200 trees one day. You can see Brandon's drone there, got to this viewpoint, his drone top left there. And uh, at the end of it, uh, we could take down, this is the moment of celebration, we could take down the closed sign because BC Parks gave us permission to do this. And since then, this has really become a highway. Um, it's one of the, you know, this is the view, the photograph that you see in Vancouver Airport when you land. And the fact that BC Parks closed this was unbelievable to us, and it was our great privilege to go and reopen it, put up these signs. Uh, to, we've created about two or three kilometers to all these viewpoints, as you can see, that these are all the trails that we built. And uh, so go, to go to Canusia Falls now, which is still the single most popular destination, is now a whole thing. You don't just go there for 10 minutes, drive back, go back to Dawson Creek. If you go to Canusia Falls now, the majority of people do all these trails. They're spending three, four hours there. They'll do the stone corral. They'll stay overnight at the campground. That's one of the reasons why we've seen campground and other things, um, RV park, etc., is so popular now, because things like this keep people in town. Uh, we did some fine tuning this year. Uh, one slightly tricky section, you can see how we use four by fours there to make it easier. Got to train, train the new generation. There's Michael Clark, Thomas's son, helping us like a trooper. Uh, Velasky there, built some extra staircases this year just for some of the steep areas, put in signs like this, um, interpreting the geopark. And uh, yeah, just a, a fantastic spot here at this whole bench where you look up at the falls. This is another um, sign we put in. So we've signed all the provincial parks, and this is one of the big requirements from the UNESCO Global Geoparks Network. You can't just have provincial parks, you have to interpret them. So they are now, finally, we can say, done, fully interpreted with signs like this at the trailheads. This one we put in last year. As you can see, someone used it for target practice. Thomas and I worked with signs and things to get decals and so on. And you go there now, you can't see the difference. Someone can shoot it again, and we'll do the same again. We'll <laughs> keep on repairing these things as the vandals uh, <coughs> keep doing their thing. Uh, we also built this uh, interpretive trail at Willem Lake. Now, just, you know, Again, you've got so many people at the Willem Lake campsite, you need to give them something to do other than just camp and boat and fish. So we've got a little hiking trail there leads to another halt bench, as you can see. And this year we put in the interpretive signs for that as well. Sakanka Falls is another one up the Sakanka River, beautiful waterfall. Got the signs in there into this provincial park this year, built the staircase down to the falls. It was very steep before that, now it's safe. So this is all done with the support of uh, BC Parks. So next year, the big drive, as you know, is the universal accessibility. Um, thanks to our collaboration with yourselves, and in, in particular, Councillor Scott, uh, the proposal was at least 50% successful. So a wilderness wheelchair will be arriving in November. Uh, we're looking at improvements to the Lost Haven Cabin, making that universally accessible, looking at improving the bulldoze marshes, boardwalks, so that wheelchairs can use them. Looking at Nathan's Trail, getting a, a bobcat through that because it's flat and it leads to, it's close to town, that leads to a good view site. So if we can get a bobcat, get some wood chips or crush onto that, then we've got something in town that anybody can do. And through Community Forest, we're creating a snowshoe trail to Lost Haven Cabins, so to um, improve access for snowshoes as well. So our motto, be in it for the long haul, stay the course, don't pull the Titanic, and just hang in there. Our one problem, um, is, and I've, I've actually been speaking to Mr. Powell about this, is we we have a challenge in the long, you know, you look at these photographs and the work bees and they're 20 feet, but it all looks fantastic. But the reality, 100 kilometers of trails, um, it's a big burden. We've got about two or three people that do regular trail maintenance. So, you know, the geopark depends on accessible geosites without people having to step over 20, 30 trees on the way. Um, it is a challenge. We're always trying to find more and more volunteers, but I've been talking to Mr. Powell just about the idea. We've got to think, you know, 10 years from now, can we keep on depending on volunteers? Are there ways to expand things and get trail crews? Unfortunately, they cost money because volunteers just do the job. Trail crews, you've got to get tickets and courses and safety stuff. And you saw with the JCP thing last year how it just escalates very quickly. But I just think it's um, Thomas and I have been speaking about just uh, starting that discussion, not for next year, but down the road, 
making sure that we can somehow um, continue to maintain the trails. And Brother Thomas as our, our new president. So uh, I must uh, thank you all for all your uh, support because I've lived in other communities uh, in my uh, past and there is, I've never lived in a place where there is such hand-in-hand -hand cooperation between like volunteers and the district. It's, it's, uh, I love it. It's why I live here and uh, that's all I got to say. <laughs> Well, well, thank you, thank you very much for your. Can we have the lights back on? Can't see Thomas. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it's um, <clears throat> nice to see. You know, like, you, you mentioned the community force in, a lot of times, and, and other other groups in town. It's nice to see everybody working together creating. I mean, the, the World Working Nordic Society, since I've been in Tumber Ridge, I've just been amazed what you guys do. But it's also nice to see other groups helping you out and, and be part of it too. So, you know, it's, it's uh, we're creating something really awesome here. And uh, you guys are in the forefront of it. And uh, I appreciate it very, very much. Thank you very much for what you do. Does anybody in, on council have any questions or Thank you, uh, Bishop and, and Charles. Welcome, and it's nice to meet you. Uh, just a question with regards to the work that you would like to continue it to, to get it done, as it were, um, and so forth. Any any idea as to what it would cost to do what it is you'd like to get done? To say, okay. We've done what we wanted to do. Now it's going to be a maintenance thing that we have to whatever. But any, can you give us an idea as to kind of dollars you'd be looking at to finish it with the dream that you have in mind? Um, we can both probably try and answer that. But um, you know, 100 kilometers is actually an exceptional amount for a small volunteer group to be doing. So we've actually kind of reached the point where it's got to be a really darn good reason why we would build something new. Because every time you build something new, you've got to maintain it. Yeah. And we're, we're at the phase now where you know we can put in more benches, we can, but it, we can do little enhancements to what we've got. But we actually think we've got enough. And henceforth, it's more of a maintenance thing. <clears throat> I was asking Jerry Lynn um, what she thought um, based on the JCP program for the ATB trail. And I mean, she was saying, what we do, if you want to put a dollar figure on it, like 200 grand a year, that's what she thought. But we've never, I mean, we've never thought of no. what, what it comes to. We just do it. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's fun. Sure. And, mm -hmm. you know, the moment it stops being fun, we, we'll stop doing it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's never crossed our minds, but I kind of thought you might have that question, so I went to her. You probably got the best experience based on the JCP last year, and what that cost. And she thought, well, yeah. You're going to hire a trail crew. It actually gets quite expensive quite quickly. Sure. Okay. Well, thank you. <clears throat> um, you know, uh, you, you talked about that succession plan kind of thing. And I think that's really important because there's there's going to be a time. I, I saw you crippled up with a finger. This is, yeah, this is, a, trail, was, this is <laughs> a trail of the use injury. <laughs> I was really worried when I seen that. So, and you were talking about you were going out and picking up garbage with your other hand that morning. So you know it's it's just maybe something that uh, uh, grants can handle a student type type thing. You know that that we can bring people out here in, in, in the spring and, and go through the trails and, and you know it's something we we've got to look at because uh, you know. Volunteers are great, but there's sometimes the <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I still I'm amazed with what you guys do, and uh, but we, sh we should be talking about that because it could be something real important down the road. So anything else from council? Okay, well we we kind of split you up, Charles, because. Uh, we, not that we get tired of you talking, but we want to, we want to be, have a bit of rest before we get to the section. <laughs>
All right, and so our second one is uh, the TR Community Court uh, update from uh, Duncan McCallum. Some stats, I guess, for the first half of the year. Um, I always start off with our operational reforestation, just so common things here that there is not being enforced, and we're way up to date with that. And we keep our funds set aside. We have about, I'm guessing about seven hundred thousand dollars in bank just for reforestation operations. So that's a good thing. Um, we planted uh, ninety-seven thousand trees this summer, and we're going to plant three hundred eighty thousand next spring. Planting a little more survival rate is better. It is. Um, I've talked about it before, but we've asked for an uplift from our, our allowable cut for to manage the remaining uh, dead timber that's still in our system chart. And after that, we should have we've captured most of what we can capture. So uh, we have accelerated the cut a bit to mid 2018. So uh, we plan to harvest in 2017 60,000 meters, and we're at about 37,000 so far. And today was the first day we started coming off our forest. Uh, the forest. The Fraser's harvest in the uh, Fall Creek area, two blocks away. Our gross revenue to June 30th, just for 2017, is $1.17 million. That's gross revenue. Of course, we have to take a bunch of that money and put it in the fund. The next about 720,000. Our net equity in the bank, that's the net of uh, any, I know we took 200,000 originally to take out, we still have $1.5 million in the bank. So we've got a significant amount of dollars to uh, put towards the community as a uh, grant and whatnot come forward from folks like uh, we just talked about the drop to uh, happen. Um, a couple other things. We hosted the Community Forest Association in the end 2017, and uh, it was a great success. And thanks again to the community <coughs> for supporting us there and uh, others. Um, we uh, completed the Forest Compliance Audit in November of our last year. I don't think I've talked to you since then. It was published in November 9th. And it was a good, good news story. <coughs> a couple of community forests in the past, like in Pride and a few others, in the province had pretty bad ones. The tarnish, but we had kind of got a golden review, so that's good news. Um, we have the expansion area that you're probably aware of, and it's still in the works. Uh, the governments were moving pretty slow on that, but I haven't heard anything negative. It's they're still in our proposed area, which is basically trying to uh, combine our existing areas and move down towards following sort of the highway back border or down towards the airport. That's the main. So that's the uh, expansion. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Let's get a bit of a new release uh, talking about compliance audit results. Um, so, both our You should go look at the report in the, in the site. It also talks about what we're doing with wildfire on top of it. And that's going to be a bit later in my presentation, but it also talks about how we've already seen the expectations from wildfire. And, uh, so, this is, uh, I just want to give a quick uh, couple of shots. I went around earlier this uh, this month and took a few pictures of the CP1 Block 1, about 20 kilometers out towards uh, Dawson. That one has some visual. Uh, work done on it, 
And uh, so it's hard to in 2013 and see the plant Here's another tree closer up. That tree was planted in 2014. It was rocked in 2013. And it's about the time. So that block is just stock. It's an example of some of the reforestation work. This is a uh, the horse day, I call it the horse table block, rock 21 by the horse tables, and it gets a photograph of the, what it looks like from one position in the ground. And that's an aerial view of the horse all the area that's like harvested for uh, wildfire management. Um, that road that's there now is going to be converted into a trail and uh, we'll start next week. So it'll be narrowing and rolled up, you know, putting a few more uh, images in it and making but as wide as the ski trail is now. And it will be planted next year, but it's planted for the year after we'll be planted as well. So it's treated. Okay, a little bit on wildfire. So, as you're aware, we've been doing wildfire management around the town for some time now. Uh, Majority of the areas that were high risk uh, within two kilometers of the town. Uh, there is still one area that we haven't uh, really addressed, and I'll get into that one area. And I'd just like to get some thoughts, maybe a little conversation, maybe not now, but just what I'm proposing, and then you know, we can come back fairly soon and see what you have for information on that piece. Um, part of this area is in town land that I'm going to show you. It's not just community. So I had a few statistics while I was sitting around here about 3 o'clock today. Wildfire's been, you know, pretty nasty this year. And, and over the last few, few decades, you know, I don't know if you want to contribute to a, the, uh, the uh, global warming or what not. But as of today, there's 163 wildfires burning in the province. A total of 1,200 wildfires have been burning, totaling 1.148 million this year. The average, the 10 year average is 154,000 hectares. We're 10, we burned 10 times as much this year as BC so far. So we did 10 year average. Currently, there's about 4,000 firefighters still fighting. There's still 21 evacuation orders in the province, and 47 evacuation alerts. In 2016, there was 1,050 wildfires. And it only burned 100,000 hectares. But it's, it, you know, it goes up and down. You can look at the 10 year averages. Uh, the 10 year average is 154,000 hectares, crossing about 180 million every year. 38% of those fires over the 10 year average are caused by humans. So you can't see a lot of detail here, but it, uh, again, anytime someone wants to see this more in detail, that's more available because it, you know some of this is pretty far from your city but all the different polygons there that are sort of purple have been treated over the last six or eight years and the yellow ones are more of the harvest slash harvest block so the top 21 being uh, horse block, golf block and so on and the bottom <coughs> I don't know if that's much surface here but this one here is the, the pond block they called it again slash harvested area this was townland yellow ones were Purple ones are a myriad of different tenures, some being tree forest, some being townland. The area that has, is still of, of uh, interest to be looked at is in here. This green line here is town property, considered town property. This property here is townland, is uh, tree forest land, is considered tree forest land. You've seen this before, this is a threat class map that was done a few years ago, 2014. Orange is high, the red is, or the red is high, sorry, the orange is medium, the yellow is low, and the brown is town. So, town is the brown area, in here. This is the end of pond block, and so on. Some of these red areas over here we've met and looked at with the experts from wildfire groups, and for various other uh, resource needs, those are pretty much, that's what we're going to do. We're not going to go in there. In any significant way and, and take timber away that's decreasing. But the 
do any work uh, around, say, this is a golf course, there's a cliff there in the golf course on the traditional result. So we need newly wildfire manager to be like, taking leaves off trees or something like that. We're not going to be removing trees and cliffs. In around the other big red log north of town, that's all the ski trail area. Again, it's got other higher use areas, higher use need, and it uh, doesn't seem to make any sense to go in there and take more trees away. However, this area down here, this orange and this red area here, um, still hasn't been treated, and this is a hillside there, which again, fire doesn't go downhill as fast as it goes uphill. So again, it's not, even though it's red, it's not as much of a hillside. So there is the area of the total. This is the, the that's what we're doing here. This is a light commercial area. This is what's harvested two years ago. And then we just select this big pine out. You know what happened there, all the sort of blew down. This, this red area here is is the what we did to make that funny shape is we looked at three-dimensional three-dimensional imagery from these figures and we see where the tall dead trees are. <coughs> Another good reason why it's all convoluted like that is because it also helps break up the imagery of this particular hillside to be, to be visual. And again, this, this green line is the town property line. So this land here is town land. So here, this is uh, city forest land, and there's a tiny piece of town, town land in there. Show it a little bigger. This is that's the gravel pit, and uh, this is a, a proposed uh, treatment area. There's a the second one, and the third one being that. The scale that's 20. The hectares right. This is uh, 26 hectares, and 12 hectares of the 26 is town land. So almost half of it is. This different colored green that grows is supposed to be contained in these colors. This is black spruce, and this is uh, more pine spruce and pure forest spruce. This is what it looks like when you zoom in, like when you walk through it. Uh, significant amount of mortality that's happened in 2014 with this imagery. And I don't know if you can carry count three trees there, but half of them. There's another uh, image of looking down from the highway. I'm sort of hovering over, I guess, somewhere near the car block. I'm looking down the highway into the town. And so this is a, one of the two, the two small block treatment areas in here trying to manage the, the fire risk here. And then the larger one is just over here. We don't have a helicopter picture of it. So that's the presentation. Um, Open to questions, and before I talk, so as, you, as I mentioned before, part of the uplift is to manage for the dead trees that are remaining in the entire community forest. And this is one of the last remaining areas of pine leaving dead trees, and also uh, medium to high hazard in, from a wildfire treatment perspective. Um, you know. Again, I don't like to har harvest anywhere near communities if I can avoid it. <laughs> but it would be uh, unprofessional of me not to bring it to your attention and say, I think we still need to treat this area. And, uh, and take it from there. Because part of it is your town land, it's your responsibility, I guess, to decide on that for sure. And you would make a decision on this. Um, this would be consulted, of course, just like the other ones were. I don't have a good uh, recreational opportunity that I can think of in that area that, that some of the other areas own to have, like the pond walk has some opportunities, the horse, the horse walk has a trail ability. <coughs> this one it is a hill, maybe it's uh, has some mountain bike uh, opportunities that I don't know yet. Anyway, that's where we're at. Thank you for it. Thank you. Um, I guess the argument I, I've always been those guys and you, and you know for the years here I, always, I hate to cut the tree down but <laughs> with what we've seen happen in the last couple of years here um, it's a good argument for cutting the tree down 
But um, we, we walked uh, the pond area. Up to you, guy, and we had some input into that. That was, that was nice to have. So you know, if you are planning on doing something around around town, I mean, good argument to do it. But it, it should be nice for us as a council if you if you, if you want to have a have a, a walk around and just because you know we're we're, we're trying to. Build this as a pristine area that you can come in and you can uh, you can be part of nature and all that. So you know, trees are part of that. So and I know I know the uh, pond area worked out great. But, uh, there's, there's a lot of talking going on before any trees are cut. So I I, I'd, I appreciate that. And I don't know what the rest of the council feels, but uh, I, I would sure. We'll walk with you in a few more areas if that's what it takes. Right. Anybody on council got anything? Go ahead. Is there a cost to the town when we're um, looking at reducing the, the debt trees due to wildfire and making it safer, or or do you recoup in harvesting um, the trees? Yeah. So the town land. Uh, Right, probably more revenue than the, than the town forest or tree forest land because I have tree forest as I law. The town land, or the town land, you know, we leave it, right? Or if you want to tree forest it, we can manage that. But no, we would do this at a at profit. We, we would use cost. I think the net profit, if I'm not mistaken, my memory for the pond lot was forty or fifty thousand dollars a head. Um, we made money on the first lot of the so I don't have that figure, but I can yeah, they, there's nice timber in there too, but it, there's a lot of dead wood in there. The dead wood's running out of time. Um, before, even if you go out the few blocks I was at today, you pile up the, the debris piles are getting even higher and higher because of the song they're running away from. And sometimes I try to sell phone logs or even the dead tops to because it does chill in the pantry. But those markets keep coming and going. So, you know, when I get into this last bit of heavy dead wood, Try to look at marketing as much as a cannabis and don't want to see it burn up. Uh, if the, the, I guess that's the one thing, the one time caddy with this is I have to make it I have to harvest by mid 2018 to get that uplift with this. Up, what I call up with wood and dead wood. And uh, secondly, the wood is deteriorating. You know, so it's going to be less and less market. I would guess maybe three or four years from now, unless there's a new market that opens up. Hope somehow this new technology would be helpful. There's too much, too much trash to get left. Anybody else? Uh, we, we, we appreciate what you do down here. You've done a lot of community sports. Uh, um, yeah, like I say, it, 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 you read the news lately and uh, it's scary. You know, when uh, you live around all these trees. Hopefully we never have to fight that fight, but uh, what we can do to avoid it, we should be doing. Yeah. Okay, I'll uh, I'll just move ahead a bit with some of the those, those shapes are you know this computer image shapes right now, but uh, probably just you know around there. You know, you can do that anymore. Probably a broad audience as well. Get a little more feedback. Um, if it's a if it's let's in the town land, if you don't want that. If you really want to protect the whole the town from fire, you can put a big donut around it. Right? <laughs> Nobody wants that. Yeah. Exactly. And, it, and it's not to say that this, these prescriptions are going to stop uh, you know, the wall of the town by slowing it down and making it unmanageable. Mm -hmm. That's the that's concept. All right. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you. Five point three and uh, the Dumber Ridge uh, Museum Foundation. Dr. Hounds, get back on. Welcome again. Thanks for the break. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for the opportunity to come in and speak to you on behalf of the Museum Foundation. Uh, we do 
have a member in the audience who is our president and who is recovering and we hope going to be able to take over the reins as president again in a few weeks. And I'm the acting president, so I'm speaking in that capacity. We also have Roxanne is here, Roxanne Julie from our board, and uh, Thomas is on the museum board as well. Thomas is actually on the Wilbury president is the museum board and he's on the geopark board. Got a finger in every pie, and I should actually, when I introduced Thomas, just said, you know how, as you've said, your worship, I'm getting older, and it's really, really important, but also just very heartening to get people of Thomas's generation and age just coming forward with such amazing enthusiasm and just an interest in history and in everything, you know, and Thomas's philosophy of how we just work together and do things. It's, it's very precious. It's so, so, so good to see it coming. From a new generation, and one day Thomas will have the reins, and you know we'll be gone. <laughs> it's just good to know that it's going to be in, in good hands. But um, what I really wanted to um, address today was just to take this opportunity to address this misunderstanding that has happened between us, and to try and clarify it, and um, just to assure you of everything positive from the museum. But I think the first place is just um, your worship. When we met, um, you kind of mentioned that. Our scientists had gone to Hudson's Hope and gone to regional districts and maybe a few other places, and that it was a good time, it would be a good time not just to come here for a presentation like today, but to have something more summary, museum summary, and so on. So the difference is when we go to these other communities, the best we can do is a PowerPoint. But because we're so close here, the easiest to us would seem to be to invite all of yourselves and the staff um, just for some time in the museum and meeting our scientists again and some of our board members. So we would really like to extend that invitation to you, answer any questions, whatever, at a time of your choice in the, in the next few weeks or months, whatever works. But we'd really like to be able to work with your staff to set something up um, to make that happen. And then the second invitation, obviously, is uh, for Thursday morning at 9 o'clock. Um, and I just can't understate the significance of that skull that was discovered right, and I mean, the amazing thing, it was discovered right at the Lions campground, kind of under our noses. But, um, you know, the Geopark logo, shared brand with the district, is a dinosaur skull. And that was developed before we actually had one. Now, we've got one of a very, you know, and it's a very similar species, it's a tyrannosaur skull, so it's similar to the the uh, the brand and it's just remarkable. It dropped into our laps and it might not have happened, but it did happen. So it's just something to really celebrate, and we're looking forward to having um, yourself say a few words. That we hope as many from council can attend as possible. Um, we'd be delighted to have staff there, um, especially Mr. Bill. Um, his support with this since virtually the hour that that skull was discovered has been of enormous value to us. It's enabled us to find where it came from. And um, it's just been an absolute pleasure to deal with your staff. So we'd really like to acknowledge your staff at the same time. We will have messages from the MP, MLA, um, from um, Roxanne, her sent apologies, but we'll have Sue Kenny from the Geopark saying a few words, hoping to get a um, message from the Lieutenant Governor. And then Dr. McRae and Dr. Buckley are going to tell us why it's so important. So it should be a nice morning, um, support from the Lions Club with refreshments, and we're hoping that this will just, we've timed it so that people who are at the coal forum can enhance the coal forum, given something else to do before the events of the day begin. So we're, we'd really like to see as many as possible at that uh, event, and then along the same lines, I'm just looking forward really to being your guest speaker at the coal forum on the Geopark. Do my best to you know, cast the community and the geopark in a, in a good light. And along with that, the museum will be doing the tours, um, etc., to the dinosaur track sites and the gallery and so on. So we're just hoping it's going to be a really good event. And we're actually timing, we've done just about, it's been such an amazing field season. We've been doing virtually weekly media releases, and I've been trying to share them. I know you've been on holiday, but, holiday, but I've been trying to share them with yourself and council, and certainly with um, Mr. Wall and Mr. Powell. And, um, virtually, on a weekly basis, there's something exciting to crow about, to cheer about, and um, what we're going to do this week is something to do with crocodile tracks, because we've got some very impressive new crocodile tracks which we've discovered just recently, but it also gives us a chance to celebrate 
what Tech did when those other crocodile tracks were discovered, I think this was last year, um, they, and this is unheard of in industry, they actually built a hundred meter long road where there was nothing to get to these slabs and with the um, backhoe, that was Wayne McBreary, and he used the backhoe to grab these things and then he got the prairie crane, and I'm sorry Councillor Howard isn't here tonight, but the NSG crane as well. Both crane companies donated their time to bring those things into the temple. And it's now on exhibit and it's in production. It's, I mean, that, you know, I look at that and it just, I'm not aware of any other place where these things happen. A hundred meter road built just because they recognize the importance of heritage. So it's such a story to celebrate collaboration with industry. And here we're putting on the cold forum, you're putting on the cold forum, but we can celebrate in ways that other communities cannot do, how we break all the rules, we break the stereotypes, and we work together. And uh, so we, we're trying to time that release for Wednesday, tomorrow. I'm just going to get approval from Tech, and then it'll go out. And uh, just yesterday, um, Dan McNeil, I'm sure you know, he's a geologist, uh, calls us from the Brule Mine, got a dinosaur track with. So Dr. McRae was sick, Dr. Buckley and I went out and had a look at it, and a very nice uh, dinosaur trackway and pretty old rocks. And that brings to every, we've now got a 100% record. Every mine has reported dinosaur tracks to us, and we've gone into every mine, so we've now got that. So we're going to do a media release on that next week, sort of crowing about this 100% record. So it's, it's just, this, this whole relationship with industry is fantastic. But basically, to get um, back to the, um, the collaboration with the Geopark, you know, I've been very consistent since the very beginning when we created the concept of the Geopark and brought it to, to council that, you know, we had the Wolverine and the museum and all the good things that these groups do funnels up and the Geopark takes that and sells it to the world. You know, that's, there are other models, but to me that's always been the model that works the best. And, you know, from the museum side, that is working. Are doing a lot of good work. We're doing these media releases, scientific papers are being published. Um, on Friday, Dr. McRae and Dr. Buckley are going to Korea for a week. At the invitation of Korea, they've been inviting sort of the five top scientists from the world to come to Korea to study their stuff, similar to ours here. And then when our scientists come back, obviously they can use the Korean experience to you know, do an even better job with what we've got here. All expenses paid by Korea. It's just uh, this kind of international recognition is just it's absolutely wonderful, and um, that's just one aspect of it. Um, I'm going to be talking with uh, probably Councillor Kirby in the near future about we want to bring a bat expert in from Dawson Creek, and we want to, the museum wants to try and make Tumbler Ridge a bat friendly community, and then the Geopark can celebrate that as well. You know, just, it's another extra thing which we haven't even thought of before, but um, sometime over the winter we hope to present to you on how Dawson Creek is already a bad friendly community. We're trying to get some to reach um, the same thing. And the other thing then was the, um, the conferences that I've, I've mentioned in that uh, reply I sent to you. We've had these very successful, there's the medical conference, and next year we've got the International Ornithology Congress coming from Vancouver for a field trip here. There's a bunch of other conferences happening in the near future, which I don't have to go into detail into, but um, now just to give you an example, we've got the Canadian Society of Vertebrate Paleontology now asking if they can come here in 2019 for their conference, and that would be up to 400 people for three to six days, probably 400 for three days, and then tapering off for the next three days. Um, it's, it's, it's massive in terms of the potential for the community. And, you know, we've... I mentioned in my letter, we'd really like to just try and discuss if funding is, is forthcoming in the future, if we can somehow do it differently so that we know in advance, because we can't commit to anything like that if we don't know we're stable for funding. It's not fair to a group like that to say, yeah, come and then we cancel because there's no funding. Yet. So it's one of those things I've always thought we should just try and sit down and tackle is, is there a way to have it just more, um, more sustainable? Um, and then I'm now on the medical Education Committee for Northern Health, and we're looking at making that medical conference, which we did this year, into an annual conference. But you know, this year, we just did it on a Wednesday afternoon. I, said, I, I thought we'd have five or six people. We had 45, biggest ever in the Northeast, just on a Wednesday afternoon. All these docs from quit work and come to Tumbler Ridge, and we did it through the museum. Um, and as you know, the, the residents worked on the trails the next day for the geopark. We had this completely unique 
medical conference. There's never been anything like it anywhere else in the world. We want to just build on that and make it an even bigger thing over a weekend next May. So it becomes a bigger and better thing and we get the conference more to the PC and, and host it in the museum again. So you know, those things are, um, are hopefully coming and I've always seen Tumblr Ridge as a conference center and we just need to develop that uh, potential. Um, Education-wise, I know you had a few questions on that. Just um, as an example, in I think it's two weeks' time, I think it's grade 11, 12, you know, 30 kids from Grand Prairie coming here for three days to do their field project for their science career. Um, things like this are happening, and they're happening more often. Uh, we were challenged this year because of the late funding in terms of not being able to hire staff and therefore only being open for five days a week Longer, longer than we wanted to, we want to be open seven days a week, but those things hopefully we can all um, work together on. And just today, finally, we got this uh, communication with the library about the museum education program, and the library's programs working together and collaborating. So but through the uh, museum staff can offer educational programs through the winter as well, you know, through the through the library. So that's, that's very exciting. And just earlier this week, we got a message from JCP saying they want another major project with the museum, which means more jobs and more positions. So there's, there's just so much good stuff happening. And to me, um, a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about here is what enables the Geopark to succeed. And everything has to be geared towards 2018 revalidation. And that's what we're all crossing fingers for. And you know, we know that the more of these things that we do, um, the greater the, the chances of success. Um, just last week, for example, um, you might know Jennifer Johnson, she's one of our directors. So she came to me and said, she's, she's with the Northern Lights College, so here's another partnership. She's, but they, currently they bring some exchange students from Japan to Port St. John and a few to Dawson Creek. And the question is, why are you taking people out of Japan and putting them in those communities when you can bring them to Tumblr Ridge and give them a completely different experience? This is like 30 students coming for a month at a time, English second language. So why can't we bring them to Tumblr Ridge and the whole way of learning English can be through the exciting, cool stuff through the museum? So we had Dr. McCraig give them a lovely tour, we had a great meeting. I said to Jennifer, let's, you know, we must involve Sarah Waters from the Geopark. So we had a meeting with Sarah saying, how can the Geopark contribute to something like this? And so obviously the museum can come from one end and the Geopark from the other end. So together we work better. We had a great meeting and uh, Cross fingers and nothing's definitely happening. But it would be such, you know, these are the kind of things that Tumblr Ridge is just so ideally placed uh, to do. That. And then we just so easily just focus on the paleontology, but on Sunday, I was just talking to Roxanne about this, but you know, Richard Brooks, some of you might have met him, um, he was at Bunkman Lake in 1939 when he was eight years old. And um, so when, I, when we got here in the early 90s and we started researching the history and so on, none of us understood what had happened here before. Janet Hartford was one connection. Richard Brooks, was. we got in touch with him. So he connected us with our history. And that's really where all of this stuff started. So I got, up, I got a bit emotional, I'm afraid. <laughs> I spoke at his memorial service, which was on Sunday in, <coughs> in Grand Prairie. And I just said, you know, this is the totally rich perspective of what this great man did for us. Now we're a UNESCO Global Geopark, but you know something that's one of two in North America. But things like that began with Richard Brooks and his connections to us. You know? And so his daughter is coming here tomorrow. Here's the book that she's written in her dad's words about what it was like to be at Mount Lake in, in uh, 1939. So we want to know. I'm going to bring her in here. We're going to go to Jerry Leonard to visit us here to see can we sell these things in town. Um, and, and promote this, you know. But it's again, it's part of our history, it's part of our heritage. This is what UNESCO wants to see us doing. And um, you know, it's just another another good news story. That that takes me, all this naming, because you know, Brooks Falls is now, everyone knows Brooks Falls is the highest of the Cascades. Everyone goes there, the helicopter tourists go there. We got it named Brooks Falls. And that takes me in El Tadisol. That takes us back to when Paul Keeley was the mayor. And that tells you how far we go back yeah. with that, yeah. And you know we're still busy with naming right now. We're going to officially try and get Nesbitt's knee falls named. Our dear friend Don Nesbitt passed away in the last year. Everyone calls it Nesbitt's knee falls, but it's not official. So that's the museum's job: is to try and get things like this officially named, so it's on the maps and everywhere. You know, that's just 
part of what we do. But um, so in summary, you know, I believe we've got these three organizations and it's been my great privilege to have been involved in founding, forming each of them. So we've got the Wolverine, uh, we've got the museum, we've got the Geopark, and so there are always teething troubles when you create new organizations, and that's part of just how it goes. But I honestly think we've got enough people of goodwill just to get through all that and, and work together and make things happen. And you know, my approach is simply, you know, if, if I just and I got it, you know, I might sound vain here, but I actually take great pride in having been one of the ones to start the Geopark movement, just to see the achievements. When we had lunch, you know, we said, this, how could it be that 2014, we got another 2017, and already all these things are happening? You know, it's way beyond what I would have thought, I would have thought that 10 years down the road would be at this point. You know? And it's, um, so I feel great pride in having had a part in that. And, um, you know, there, there's some areas where I think um, we could also, as a museum, we could provide extra support and help. But again, it's all, especially with regard to the scientific input and so on, it's all with a view to 2018 revalidation. One a green card, not a yellow card, heaven forbid, not a red card. Uh, the yellow one's the one to try and avoid get a, get a, um, a green card. Um, and so I know the this um, misunderstanding that we had, some of it had to do with scientific advisors and so on, but I promised you I would just explain that just so the council also understands you know, where this misunderstanding might have happened. But um, we've taken, I've taken note of what's in your letter and how you want Dr. McCray and Dr. Buckley involved in the Geopark. Um, UNESCO Global Geoparks Network, in their recommendations, has made it very clear they don't want them as, that it specifically says we don't want PRP or C scientists, we've got this great research institution within the Geopark, and they make it very clear we don't. We think it's inappropriate for them to be scientific advisors. I was the one in the beginning that asked them to be scientific advisors. I thought that was the right thing to do. UNESCO Global Geoparks Network, in their recommendation, no, we want them to be in leadership positions on the board. That's what Geoparks do. So you want the scientists in a, in a much more involved um, position. So. This whole issue of, of scientific advisors, to me, it's, it's almost like a distraction or um, a red, a red herring now. Um, so basically, um, there are five of us Geopark members, that's Patsy, Antor, Jim, myself, Dr. McCray, Dr. Buckley. We just, we've sent a, a note to um, Roxanne as uh, the Geopark chair, He's saying, you know, what we'd really like to see is the, the Geopark board just follow these UNESCO recommendations. And I believe that's up for discussion at the next um, Geopark board meeting, and um, yeah, so we, um, and that's really, a, it's, that is separate from my job as the museum president, you know, that's me as a, as a Geopark member, but it is connected, and what we really, as a museum, want to see is the Geopark functioning to its maximum potential, and the more it functions to its maximum potential, the greater the revalidation success um, will be, and so I, you know, from my side, I just, I'm a collaborator, I'm a communicator, I try and work with everybody, as you know. I mean, to me, the sort of things that we should be focusing on are, we've got to go down to Victoria, and we have a new government, and when I speak to, when I try and understand the politics, and there is such a need for this government to show the North that they care and they want to do something, and the kind of things the NDP government might be interested in are exactly what we're talking about here, Jeff Park. All these donors, all this, all this stuff. To me, we should be trying to work together to get on there. We need to be working together on the universal access. We need to be talking about timely funding if that's possible. Um, I, I just feel really bad that we had this misunderstanding. And I, previously, from the museum side, we've said, you know, can we have a reconstitute the museum development committee? And I don't think there was interest from council in that. Maybe fair enough, you know, another, another commission is not always a good thing to be on facts. You know, I've taken, um, I've really enjoyed our meetings over coffee. And I mean, an informal chat over coffee. Because we have our monthly meetings, and Councillor Kirby comes to the meetings, and you sometimes come to the meetings. But that's still a kind of a formal setting. And I just find that if the museum president and the mayor and the liaison can meet over a cup of coffee once in a month. I think it's very hard to have misunderstandings happen. So I'd really 
I've appreciated what's happened so far, and I'd like to see us try and continue uh, with that. So, I don't want to go on uh, too long here, but um, I, I just hope you can share my frustration. And you know, I have it's, it's like every now and then we have a little misunderstanding. And previous, it's not the first one we've had them before. Whenever we have, it seems we take a step back. But in, in the past, we've always just regrouped and said, "Okay, we believe in each other." And now we're taking two steps forward. So. I hope we can do that um, again. My, my frustration is just, you know, we are so close to greatness. And everything is going so well. The things that worry me at night are things like this when we don't kind of communicate properly. And, um, you know, Linda and I, um, we probably spend five hours a day on, in doing things that are for the benefit of the geopark. We love doing it. And uh, we just really don't want to see all this work that's gone into it come to North, all, all the park. And you know, so it's just really precious to me personally to see all of this succeed. And I, in, in summarizing, I can just 100% assure you of the support of, of the museum for the geopark and wanting it to succeed and helping it wherever possible to succeed uh, through, our, through our scientists and through everything else um, that we do. Um, on Sunday, I went to the, the Philip J. Curry Museum for the first time. I had a great time. But I came out of it thinking, thank heavens, we did it in Tumblr Ridge the way we did. Because, you know, they've got challenges of operating costs of a big facility. Uh, it's, it's a whole different dimension of challenges. And the way we've done it here, through creating the geopark, it's all been done at an absolute fraction of the cost. And I think in the end, we're going to have a better product. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy with uh, the way it's been, been done here, and I hope you share that with me. And I always close just by thanking you, because we've had our ups and downs over the years, but I mean, the, the consistency of the support every year in the end has been truly remarkable, and that's what's enabled us to, to do what we've done, to create the GM Park. It took a bit of believing in us to support us in going for that. Um, and uh, here we are, 16 years later, we're still here. And so thank you again for the opportunity, and I'd love to answer questions if there are any. Yeah, well, thank you for your presentation, Charles. Uh, um, and and I, I agree with you on a lot of, a lot of things you say. Uh, I um, talk about us working together, and it's awesome, in Tumber Ridge, and uh, the industry in Tumber Ridge, and all that work together. And, and that's, that's true, that's what's happening. And that's, that's what's great about this whole thing. And that's why it's it's moving as fast as it is happening. I jotted down a few things that I, I wanted to say, and it, it, this is pertaining to the, the letter that we sent you. And uh, I um, I think it's it's a position that the council has taken that I think they were pretty pretty strong and, and wanting. So I'm, I'm just going to read this out to you, and uh, then I'll open it up to council for. Any questions they have. Um, Council has supported your organization for years and we have contributed 2.25 million in cash and another million in in-kind donations. For the past three years, Council has worked with the museum for three years to make changes. Um, we wanted more programming, more uh, kid-friendly environment. This, this didn't happen. Uh, changes recommended by the Royal BC Museum weren't listened to. Um, more programming, uh, change in budget structure, uh, more community community engagement. Council asked the museum to be more responsible with the 400,000 operating budget so that we wouldn't need to give waivers for all the money up front. In other words, plan your year a little better. Um, the museum has treated every council request with kind of like a, a fight and, a, and a, a battle. We, we've always been the whipping boy, it seems to me, and I've been on this council for a long time. The museum uh, then withdrew support for the geopark, and, and you, you said the museum didn't, but um, um, Rich and Lisa did. Well, we, 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 I see them as part of the museum. And if there's an issue there, that's the museum's 
problem, and they, they should be working that out. And um, in the end of it, um, Council's only asked for three things, and that's to work with the GeoPAR to increase marketing, education, and programming. Work with the GeoPAR to ensure their revalidation, and make tourism development a primor, pri, primary priority. And to me, those three things are pretty simple. And if, and if we're going to fund this, that has to, those things have to happen. And I, and I don't, I, I haven't heard an argument in all the conversations we've had, we've had lots of, I've never heard an argument against any of those three. So I think, I think we're working to get to the same spot. And, and um, we talked about this the other day, to, to take council out of the council decides how many dollars we want to spend on tourism. And then you got to decide how to run a museum and how to run a geo park. That, that's what we're trying to get to. And that's, I, I don't, don't see how that is a big problem. But it's, uh, it's people working together again. It's, it's all it is. And uh, that's what we're asking. That, that's my feelings. Is there anybody from council? Uh, council, a couple. Thank you, so I have a couple. <clears throat> you mentioned the, UNESCO is the one that said it's a conflict to have your scientists helping out the geopark? Yes, the Global Geoparks Network UNESCO. So you have that and pay for it from them? Yep. Stating that? Have we ever gotten some of that? Did we ever get to see that? Because I, I remember when the geopark first came about, and that was the concept, is the museum was going to be their background for research part of it. Pardon me? They were going to be the background for the research part of it, and assisting the geopark. But it seems like they're withstanding from helping them. I mean, um, Councillor, a lot of what I've been explaining here today is the support which we are continually. I mean, my reports to, as acting president, my reports to the monthly geopark board meetings are four or five pages long, listing all the things that we are doing that support the geopark. Through and, and not all of them. Some of them are heritage, historic things, but the majority of them are through. Dr. McCray and Dr. Buckley through the scientists. So I mean, that's exactly what we're doing. And um, your wish of yeah. all the things that um, your list there, I mean, the majority of those things, I mean, a lot of them we just agree on. There are a few things there which we disagree, but I, to me, everything's sort of pulled out over coffee. Um, but I mean, the one thing is Dr. McCray and Dr. Buckley have never withdrawn their support for the GFR. That is not true. What, the only thing that happened is that when um, when I was forming the Geopark, and we, we got about seven scientific advisors from all around the world, um, two of whom were Dr. McCray, Dr. Buckley, but the others from all over the place. But I mean, those, you know, the majority of those others, I don't think they've ever, ever, ever even been asked for an opinion. You know, it's like a nominal position. It looks good for UNESCO to see, for us to tell them that we've got them. But, um, you know, the, the, honestly, the, the role that UNESCO Global Geoparks Network wants for Dr. McCray and Dr. Buckley is to be on the Geopark board. And I know, I, mean, I can't speak for other people, I can only speak as president, but um, that is what they want to do. So that's the role they want to play. They think being a scientific advisor is kind of meaningless, really, and it's an annual thing which all the scientific advisors get the chance to say, um, are you going to continue or not? But I just don't think we should be distracted by that. We should be looking at what UNESCO wants for the, the research center and what they're asking the Geopark to do in terms of bringing the science in. And that will address, you know, in the midst of all the wonderful things that the, that the Geopark has achieved, I, you know, one of the things that concerns me is you have to have a balance between the science and marketing and they're both important and they, they've got to go in balance and my concern is just that we're short on science like, yes as a museum we can do all the stuff which enables the geopark to succeed but it's actually better in my view if it's a more direct thing actually on the board as directors helping out to me that's what what we need to be you know, I mean, this is totally a geopark board decision I, all i can do is give you my opinion as one of the people that founded the geopark as to what will work best and what will make UNESCO 
local geoparks network when they come here are more likely to say you guys have got the people here. That's my opinion. I can't speak right now on behalf of the geoparks. Well, well, the marketing, I think, is big, big importance to this community. That, that's, what's, that's what this is all about. Yeah. Is it's bringing people into this area and great that you guys are finding all this uh, science, um, this uh, uh, bones, everything you guys find and, and how you market, how you portray that. But what's important to us is we're spending so many dollars, it's to, it's to build, build tourism in, in Tumper Ridge is, is what we're trying to do. And uh, I guess the science part of it, that's up to the museum. Yeah, but so the, as I've said, the model to me that works the best is these two organizations, the anchors, doing all the good things. I mean, like the Wolverine, Nordic Mountain Society, we don't market the trails. We create the geosites and let the geopark do the marketing. Market. So yeah. to that's me, what that's what the same. What we're asking here. Yeah, so that's the same thing to me, is that the museum does all this good work. And it funnels up to the geopark, which is what we're doing. Because I mean, when we, when we give you a budget, um, for the museum and a request. There isn't actually a marketing budget in there. Or if there is, it's absolutely minimal. Um, so what our hope is that we do all this work, we do the programming and the other things which you want us to do, but we haven't actually got a market. I mean, our understanding has been that the Geopark would look after the marketing. And it's done, our impression is it's done a very good job with marketing. Um, so, I mean, that's one of the things I will discuss with you over coffee. You know, marketing is, we've never, previously before there was a geopark, we would say to you, look, can, through your EDO, etc., can you help us with marketing? We haven't got a marketing budget. And now it just seems that the geopark, you know, fulfills that role and can, can really do it. So that's the area where we'd like to be working with the geopark. Okay. Anybody else on council? I just have one last question. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir. So the other one, Mr. Helm, was in regards to the budget. Could doing with uh, hiring summer students and stuff like that, you marked that in your letter from July 26. Well, it uh, impossible to hire summer students or employees with necessary qualifications and skills or plan to advertise for these camps. Waiting for a budget. I don't understand why, and I know I've been on council, it's only, this has been my fourth year? Third. Third year? Yeah. And I know I've said it in the past before to make sure you guys are, are keeping some money back to have that ready for the spring. But it seems like in this comment, we're spending it all not holding anything back. So you know you have some funds to hire staff to run the, the summer camps that we've, I know I've asked for. And to me, that's marketing, not only the museum, but it's also marketing the district to Tumble Ridge. It's when we can have summer camps. Yeah, it's, but we had summer camps this year. We did have summer camps this year. I, I know, but in your letter on, on yeah. July 26th, yeah. you marked down how you couldn't hire summer students. Yeah, and, so, shops. No, but so with the summer camps this year, we did the best we could with what we had and with the staff we had, but we did run camps. Um, I can give you the numbers if you want, but I mean, we ran very successful camps this year, so that very definitely happened. Um, you know, I mean, I think we had, I mean, the, the issue this year is we were, once again, it was sort of touch and go towards April, May, before we knew if it was going to be any fun at all, and we don't have that cushion. Um, we, you know, what we have developed has been, compared to other museums, has been on a shoestring, on a fraction of what, of what other museums have developed, you know, with, with, with some, even with similar budgets. So, um, your best students and your best staff, they snapped up by February. If we have to wait until May, for example, to know if there's going to be funding, we haven't advertised. We haven't, you know, so we've got to, we've got to try and catch up there. So um, to me, that's, as I've said, that's one of the areas where I'd really like us just to to work it out better and to see, because in uh, way back, a long time ago, we used to hear, just like we hear from the regional district, your funding is guaranteed. So when we call the regional district on the 1st of January, the funding is there. And we're always hoping that we can try and do something similar here. Um, because I think you can sense my frustration in that letter, you know, 
we are so grateful when the funding comes. But the timing always hits us badly, and then we can't do as good of a job as we want to do, and as good of a job as you want us to do. Because we haven't, you know, by the time you hear you've got funding in May, now you start looking for summer students, the best ones, that, and especially, you know, we need folks with some scientific training to be giving the kind of tours we're talking about and doing the education camps we're doing. It's not grade 11, 12 students, it's often people with qualifications, and they've got their summers, by May, they know what they're doing. So, hey Charles, I'll just interrupt you a little bit. One of, one of the things is, we don't set that schedule, the province does. When, that's when they have their taxes, that's when we know how much money we have to give out, so that we're stuck with that. And it's, we've been doing it for 16 years, so I mean, it's even going to maybe work with that, so that they can. But, um, Thank you, Your Worship. In your in your first presentation, um, Charles, you talked about the Emperor's Challenge and the t the Tyrone with with that event alone, you can that money keeps your trail maintenance going. So, what could your revenue generating event be for the museum? Can we see something in the future like? You know, a business has a float for the next year so they can start off. I, I think council has said several times that the the program and the dino camp should be something that should be already planned for the year, the next year. So, you know, those are things that we're looking at is revenue generating. And uh, and that's something that we, we haven't really seen yet. Yeah, I cannot tell you how relaxing it is on Wolverine. Um, having an event like that, I mean, I was one of the founders of the Empress Challenge as well. Um, so that all we ever need to do with council is come and give you a presentation like we did tonight. You know, it is so relaxing. I mean, it's one of the it's one of the challenges for me that I've just never, and I, I did try to open up and be very frank in my reply to you. It's just one of the things that upsets me is that, you know, we get into these difficulties and differences every now and then. and. I know that it's all about money. If, if, if it wasn't a funding issue, everybody would just be totally happy we're doing such a great job. It's, it's, it's about money. And that's unfortunate. But, you know, we, I mean, the one defense for that is to say, well, okay, if you hadn't funded us, you wouldn't have a geopark. We've given you a geopark um, through being solid with science, building on that. Um, it's an eye opener to me how the museum in Grand Prairie is struggling. It's easy to get funding to build something, it's harder to get funding to operate something, in spite of how many, ever yeah. many businesses they're getting. That's why I said the way we've done it here creating a geopark, giving you that, allowing you to run with that and create this great, varied thing. I mean, to me, that is success. That is That shows that your money and previous council's money has been well invested. Um, I would, yeah. I mean, to answer your question, maybe one can get to the critical mess where if we have enough funding, we can make things happen so that we generate more and you get into a positive vicious cycle. Yeah. But right now, as you can see, you know, we're, we're always sort of trying to catch up and wait for the next funding so we can arrange something. And it's, uh, it's we totally agree it's not ideal. You know, Your Worship, the three main things, I mean, in your summary there, what you read out, I think you know, that's what was written six weeks, two months ago. And I hope that many of those things we've kind of addressed in the meantime. But as I remember, your three summary points at the end, I mean, that's what we've got to work together on and just find good ways to do it. Yeah. Just, uh, I hope you can work with, with the Geopark and get that, get that solved. I, I don't see it. Big issue, and I'll give you a, yeah. a copy here so that you have exactly what I said. But, yeah, yeah and there's one other thing that I said to Councillor Kirby on the phone a little while back is that you know, I mean, many things I'm going to say that you agree with, many that you don't agree with. But um, what I did say to Councillor Kirby is please, you know, just if you look around town and just work out, re recognize bridge building when you see it and support it and people that are trying to bring groups together and work together. I mean, I think it's always important um, to recognize that and to support those things. And I mean, you see it from the world green, like what uh, Thomas said, um, you know, there's 
this, this is the most amazing community because we all work together. I mean, that's very precious coming from Thomas, and that's the same thing. You know, I can echo what Thomas says, and I can, from in representing the museum, I, mean, I, I cannot do more here tonight than assure you that the museum wants to work together, wants to support, wants to collaborate. That's what we're about. I mean, I'm speaking in a personal capacity as well, because you've known me for 25 years, I've been your family doc, you've known me through all these organizations that I've helped found. I mean, you know when I tell you something, you can believe me, and at a personal level as well, you know, I am a collaborator and a communicator, and I'm trying to get everybody working together. It doesn't always work, but I mean, one keeps trying. So, I, ca I cannot do more here tonight than assure you of that. I, I got I to call an end to this, uh, but uh, thank you, thank you, Charles, and, and I'll give you the copy of this, and uh, hey, uh, like, like it said in the paper there, we should have this all solved by this fall, so I'm, I'm really think we can. So, I mean, from, from my perspective, it is, it's history and it's all. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, that takes us to 5.4. First APC, Gavin Friend. Yeah, thank Gavin. you. Welcome to our delegation day. <laughs> this is my first time doing this. It's a great novel experience. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, so my name is Gavin. I work for Wild Safe PC. Uh, I'm the community coordinator for this season. I'm just here to tell you a little bit about how the season's gone so far, what I've done, what I plan on doing in the future while I'm still here. Um, so the program started in June. Um, so I had a week of training and then I'm here on the ground. Uh, that first week was the grizzly that we had in town, the young grizzly, and it was relocated. And that kind of, things were quiet for a little bit after that, but there's been 28 calls into the conservation officer service uh, since June. Um, a lot of those are one or two individuals. There's a dark grizzly that's in town, in and around town right now, and it accounts for probably half of the grizzly sightings that have been in tumblers for the last little while. Uh, it's a docile bear. It's not it's non-confrontational. It's pretty. It's doing its own thing. So um, when I get my information from Wart, which is the so it's available to everyone. It's just general information. Um, so yeah, 28 calls into the cost. 60 of them were. Grizzly bears. 50% um, of those calls were for the first grizzly, and 50% were for this most recent uh, red one, or brown one, sorry. Um, there's been six black bear, but I'm gonna go ahead and guess that two of those or three of those was the large grizzly being mistaken for a black bear. Uh, I've seen it in person. It's the big bear, but it's really, really dark. And it looks like a black bear. Um, so all of them have been sightings except for one, uh, which is a sighting, but it gets characterized on what the source is. So if the bear is just wandering through town, someone sees it, they call the conservation officer service, it gets reported as a sighting. This one, uh, the only different one from that would be one that got into uh, a backyard fruit supply. Uh, so someone on the other line told the conservation officer that they got in the fruit, and uh, that's something that I'll talk about later. That's one of the bigger problems that I'm seeing uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, so that was on Peace Road, one of the houses, and I'm pretty sure it was actually a, a neighbor's house. And there's a lot of uh, houses that are empty with fruit trees on them. And so what happens is you get a bear coming into that property, gets used to the apple bear, or apples, and then no one notices that it's taking the apples and just starts not living there. And they only notice it when it's the neighbor and it's there below the apple tree and they have kids, and that's when it starts to become a problem. Because that bear now knows apples, trees, food. Um, so part of what my role is when I get a notification that uh, there's a bear in town, or last week a uh, conservation officer called me, uh, Brad Lacey called me, and just said, can I put up signs or something in there, can I do this? So that's kind of my role is to respond with education uh, to minimize conflict. Uh, so when a bear is spotted in a certain area, what I'll do is I'll put up signs on the, on the high use trails. So for a specific example, being a piece of investment, it's our green space. Um, I put signs at either end of the trail or the bear in the area. Uh, I canvass the immediate houses on that area to let them know that there's a bear in the area, what they can do to minimize their conflict. Um, half of those houses, it didn't look like there were people 
living there, and the trees were quite heavy with um, this apple tree. And that's a pretty big risk. That's a direct attractant for a mare to come right in and uh, that up. So, um, I also do garbage tagging. So I go out Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday night, go put the garbage out early that night. That's a really straightforward attractant, uh, something that we can cut pretty easily. Uh, I love Thunder Ridge because most of the buckets that I tag, I don't ever see them again. You look at the message, okay, I'll, I'll just put it out in the morning. And that's really great. There are a few houses that have their bins permanently at the end of the driveway. Um, I'm pretty sure garbage bylaws are coming. Timing of garbage, I'm not sure about that. Um, but, uh, uh, natural fruit, so uh, the berry crop is pretty good this year. Uh, I'm saying that from my personal experience. I don't know about the outside area, but um, yeah, berries were pretty good this year. And I'm basing that, I did a, uh, a berry load survey for Tumblr Ridge. So I basically went into every green space 100 feet within uh, Tumblr Ridge and I um, did like an actual scientific study of uh, the composition. So who, what species of plants were there that bears would consume and what sort of abundance or what sort of load each tree or each bush um, had on average. And they were pretty heavy bushes. And from doing my footwork with responding to grizzly calls, uh, I've seen bear scat that is just pure bears. So they're getting their fill of wild berries that's gonna dry up soon, as we know, and then they're gonna start going for those trees and yards and I know last year there was a bear that had to put down for uh, getting into someone's backyard and in going to door to door, door and talking to people in that neighborhood this season I have heard that it started with the house that no one was living in they got that tree and then two houses down and that's when they hit someone's tree who cared about their tree and as soon as a bear is food conditioned uh, not a lot of response besides um, killing the bear because they're highly food driven and that's that part of the brain that they can't quite control. Um, yeah, so this next month, in September, is kind of the make or break month for whether or not I could just, I could say Tumblr Ridge did great or Tumblr Ridge did okay. Um, right now, there's been no conflict that I know of. There's just been sightings. But as berries start to dry up, those food sources in town start to dry up, sometimes bears don't leave, they come in. And that's kind of where I'll be intercepting. So September is going to be, I have BC Goes Wild event, and that's kind of an educational event. Um, I'm also going to the high school so, and trying to get that information out as, as quickly as possible because I still see, like I said, trees that are full of, full of food. Um, and that's apples, that's crab apples, that's choke cherry, that's pink cherry, that's an ash tree right there, that's a bear we eat, that's those berries. Right um, and it's, it's on private property, it's also, um, I know this city is used, or the town has used apple trees and ash trees as um, landscaping trees, and that's a direct attraction too. Um, so yeah, all the events that I have been to or will be going to, so I've done Canada Day, I've done the elementary school, um, pretty much half the school there. I did the library's reading event, Grace Guys Book Days, I did the Dino Camp, um, I have BC Goes Wild coming up on the 16th and 17th, and that's going to be uh, interpreting bear signs, learning how to camp in bear country, the safe and appropriate use and deployment of bear spray, and then a night hike. Um, and then I'm doing the early years children's fair, and then I'm also visiting the high school. Um, yeah, so I'll keep doing the garbage tagging, uh, the response to sightings. Um, I've been doing less door to door. I've found uh, previous years that um, coordinators used it quite heavily. And I don't know what happened. But even around when I got here and I started uh, in the pavement, there was, a, there was someone going door to door that was selling something. And there's something that happened previously where there's a bad taste in people's mouth about going door to door. And I just so happened to start my program right at that time. And so I kind of got a lot of people when I got to their door being what are you doing here? I don't want you at my door. There's someone going around canvassing for a security system or something. So I just kind of backed away. And I also just wasn't getting a positive read on, on meeting people at their doors. Um, so I, I've been doing less of that and more of using that tool 
cool as a reactive uh, tool. And I'm allowed to do that with my program. I kind of get to like read the, the community and then their responses and sort of things. So I've done less of that and that's more of a reactive thing. People are a lot happier to hear that there's a bear, um, that I'm there to notify them that there's a bear in the area and that that's why I'm there rather than tell them to do something that they did not do. Uh, I use Facebook a lot. That seems to be a lot of traction. It also seems to be the place where people talk and get a lot of their local sort of information. Uh, I'm still seeing people posting on Facebook about wildlife and then it doesn't transfer to the uh, database, which means that people are saying they're reporting stuff and they're not, which is tough. I, I, for the most part, ever since you guys rolled out the program with the um, report the sightings, um, I was talking to Brad recently saying that reporting is, is like night and day from what it used to be. And people are, are reporting and on Facebook because the second comment is to be reported always. So that's really good to see. We're happy about that. Uh, when, when the cause is in contact that they don't know what's going on. And really they're doing a lot of behind the scenes track. They track the bear with pins basically and say, okay, well, we know this here. Oh, he might be going this way or we should watch. He's getting closer and closer to town and stuff like that. So um, it's, that's good. That's my favorite bit about the bear. Um, some of my concerns. Undocumented trails to backyards. There's a lot of that. And to me, that's, I mean, I don't know if you guys know a lot about animal behavior, but animals follow paths. Doesn't matter what animal you're talking about, humans, bears, they follow paths. Um, berries grow really well on paths. So you kind of have these conduits right into people's backyards. And then people wonder why there's a bear in their backyard eating their apple tree. So um, there's a lot of berry bushes within the 100 meters, 100 feet of backyards. I know in the past there was talks about sort of bushwhacking in those areas in the spring. Um, that, would be uh, that would be something that we support because uh, one of the main reasons why bears are sticking close to town is those natural berry sources. And you can't do much about what's happening outside of town because it varies for kilometers. And this is like the very central, uh, at least from my experience, I've never seen berry loads and diversity of berries in one spot uh, like I have. Um, garbage out the night before, still a bit of a problem. It's about 5% of uh, residents um, have been marked down to have, be, have been marked down as leaving their garbage out the night before. Uh, so that's pretty low, but we want to kind of get it to zero because garbage is an easy one and the worst one. Um, fruit in yards, like I said, the trees that are being attended to. Uh, making houses with trees, that's another big one. A lot of pets, too. Uh, I don't know. This is an ongoing problem, but there are a lot of um, dogs and cats and bunnies that I see out and about all the time. And when I post on Facebook, this dog was found, or my cat's been missing. But I just see there's a lot of negligence on the ownership of that ownership side. And then reactance when I know last year there was a cat that was take, probably taken by coyotes. And you kind of want to. I mean, that's kind of out of my wheelhouse for pet stuff. Uh, I can encourage people to keep their pets in, but it seems to be a pretty big problem. I had the same dog arrive at my house like three times. And now all I can do is call the person or, you know, let the person know that their dog is <coughs> the, the third time. But I can see that really being a potential problem too, where someone gets their dog killed, the cat goes missing, and something happens. And, um, and for coyotes, they're kind of attractive. If a coyote knows that there's tons of wild animals, or domesticated animals here that are pretty helpless and easy targets. They tend to sit in here. Um, and we saw a cat this morning, or a, a, a dead cat on B-52, and there were coyotes uh, at the end towards the bald spot. So it's, it's happening. So um, the green belts and the green spaces, so Chamberlain Crescent, um, the first 100 feet that was kind of uh, fire treated behind uh, East River Crescent and uh, uh, the Steve Rock Close Road. <coughs> Old Mackenzie Way, Murray Drive, those undeveloped lots, apparently a bear was seen in there. I'm not sure if I um, believe that, but um, Pioneer Loop is another one, and um, sort of the undeveloped areas of, around Canisio. Uh, they seem to be hangout spots and sort of corridors of movement. And so the nice thing would be to remove berries from those areas that are in town and easily bushwhacked. Uh, 
Bears are going to use them at their rate, and that's good. It means that they're in that town. But as soon as there's a food source there, they plop down. And there's that grizzly that was just most recently seen right by the water treatment. If you go into that bush, there's tons of bears in there. So they have reason to stick around. Um, and that's kind of what we want to avoid. Uh, yeah, so that's pretty much what I've been up to. Uh, but yeah, if you have any questions? Thank, thank you for your presentation. Uh, Mr. Scott. Do you work close to the seal? Um, the first call that people do see a bear is to be calling the seal. Um, what happens if they direct the call to you first? Do you follow up and record it just to ensure that it's um, being recorded to the seal? No. So if someone calls me, I would immediately direct them to the call. Okay. Because it's a dangerous wildlife in a residential area. Um, yeah. And if if I go and you know go long distance and I don't see it come off the recorded just to maintain the integrity of the data that's going in, they won't accept me saying my friend saw a bear or you know a resident saw a bear. They need firsthand, uh, or else you know anyone. Can call. So, I guess just, just so that, that initial call by residents should be to the conservation officer. Yeah. And then, um, are, do you prepare a report at the end of your your season here? Yeah. I'm interested in the underbrush that you have noticed around town okay, yeah. that the with the berry sources. Because that's probably something we could possibly look at, or, you know, wish racking like you recommended, yeah. to eliminate that, that source in town so that the bears do move through on the corridors. Exactly. Yes. Okay. So I have a I have a bear like a well, it's an entire package and it's just uh, for, for the research and uh, kind of moral mm -hmm. and uh, there's three species and they're big bushes. It, it would be pretty easy uh, in mm -hmm. my opinion. But yeah, also I can send that. Um, okay. Or I can include that in the final package, and that would be pretty easy to pass on to the Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Worship. Well, just a question with regards to location uh, of spotting the bears. In in your report, do you indicate where the bears were spotted? The locations? My year-end report? Yes. Uh, I mean, the report that residents can get a hold of if they wish to. The fact so, that there was three on Canusa Avenue, there was four wherever. Do you break it down to that degree? So all of my information I get about where a bear and when a bear and all of that information, like all the sightings, is through a program called WARP. And it's online. Anyone has access to it. Um, it's, through, it's, done, it's done through Wild Safety C. And basically, it piggybacks on the conservation office services calling and like some of the, like as much information as you give the call in is what I get. So we get a lot of people going, I just saw a bear on Mackenzie Way. They get the time, they get the, the, the callback number, but when it comes up on a mine database, it, a lot of them are just the central where's Humber Ridge located like GPS coordinates. And that and all of them will pile up in that one spot, and not it hasn't been you know 38 bears seen. I think it's on Feller Lab. The, the point that it's the middle of Tumble Ridge is right on Feller Lab, and so I don't I don't know exactly where they've been seen. I go on immediately after it gets I see a notification. I go on Facebook because that's how you actually get the information. Because then you get someone going. I saw a Mackenzie Way by the baseball fence. Oh, okay. Well, now we know it's that. Um, in my report, it would be up to me whether or not like how much need. I might have to call the conservation officer service for that information specific where to use. Um, but you could look on WARP and you can get the last four years of all seeds across for the area. And that would give you a better idea of where they are. And I could probably tell you it's, um, it's, it's a middle bench in Birch Park. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, uh, just one quick question. Thank you, Mayor McPherson. So you've given us the heads up that once these the berries are kind of ran their course, the bears will be looking at the fruit trees. So you mentioned that there's quite a few vacant lots. Now, do you, I mean, looking forward, what can we do if there's the laws against going into someone's lot that there's nobody there? Do you do you post something? And do, when do you start posting that your fruit has to be re removed from trees? I will, well, I started posting that. 
Oh, okay. Months ago. Um, just went to the berry lane. So mm -hmm. I know a lot of uh, berries that they put a grass plant in front of the water in their backyard. Um, yeah. Are there many? Are there many vacant lots with, with fruit trees? Well, or just that, that was just a personal opinion. Like, I walk up to the house and yeah. I don't see a car in the driveway. The blinds are completely shuttered. Okay. And, you know, it just doesn't look like someone's been out of the house with grass as small or whatever. Okay. And specifically where I saw that was um, sort of just a few houses with fruit trees in the back, fruit trees in the front, and <coughs> like no one's picking them. As you can see, well, if there's windfall collecting, like the fruit on the ground, that, that to me is a sure yeah. sign that no one's in the house. Sort of. And there's a few houses like that. Well, well thank you. Uh, you know, uh, this report, that you give us that last year in, uh, in the spring we, we talked about what council could do to <laughs> do something about the bears because mm -hmm. last year was a bad year for bears. Yeah. And, uh, and we came up with uh, letting people know how to report. And I think it worked pretty good because it was going to move. Um, so it would be really nice to get a report from you with recommendations of what we could be doing. And then we can go over that before next spring and then see what we can do. Yeah. That sounds good. We really appreciate you uh, coming in and talking to us and report uh, at the end of the season would be possible. Yeah. Did you guys not get one last year? I don't remember one. I know, the program, I know the program was either incomplete or it was put in hibernation early because. Uh, the last coordinator got another job. So I'm, in, I know it might have been just a quick wrap up and you guys might not have gotten for it, but this year's will be a bit colder. I did the Bailey survey, I did stuff like that. Um, last, I don't know what the qualifications were for the last coordinator, but um, they're kind of using a lot of the skill set that I told them I have and that I, had, that I do have. And, yeah. and so I have a science background and that's kind of what they've been capitalizing on. Um, this year. So it'll be, a, it'll be different from last year. Um, just when is the um, expected report date and when will we be finishing up? When we uh, looking for that? that depends because if we have a warm, favorite relatively warm in October or there's still conflict happening in October, um, I would still be around. The report would always happen after that. Okay. It also depends on hours, but I'm you know, pretty strict with what I do when it comes to hours. Uh, so if those dry up end of September, then Hibernation and uh, the report ensues. So, okay. um, the Barry report, I can get as soon as my, I, I just finished it a couple of days ago and I just sent it over to my provincial coordinator to be approved because some of the species identification is a little difficult uh, when you get down to the nitty gritty. But uh, once I get that, I can send that out probably. Uh, I got a couple of those trees you're talking about, so I'm going to pick them all tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're just, I mean, a single tree, it, it, it took the one bear family three hours to just dis disassemble. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, we go to correspondence. Um, uh, Philip J. Curry, Dinosaur Museum, invite there. Is just happens that that's the day we come back from um, UBCM, so I'm not sure that there's anybody that could attend. Correspondent, um, for information or check? No, for information. No, for information. Okay, second or conversation. All in favor? Bob Zimmer, Monterey Center, uh, Bear River Project. For information. Seconder. Repeat. All in favor? Your nose and health and uh, 6.3 and 6.4 are the same thing. Um, I, I feel that we don't have any issues with the RCMP. I don't 
Other than health, I think we should uh, talk to them, keep talk, talking to them about the operation. That's my opinion. I want to bring a nurse in. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we can make sure we know exactly what we're going to bring. At this point, they might bring a nursing counselor. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we have to also travel to the uh, facilities that have been supportive to our parents or whatever, and for us, we should have to go from Tumble Ridge to Fort uh, St. John or Dawson Creek. Person. Would it be worth sitting down and talking to our medical staff uh, before we go down and just make sure we have all the information we need before we get to that meeting, all the issues? There always seems to be new issues coming up. Probably, probably. There was also that uh, committee that uh, everyone was supposed to be sending written complaints or concerns to the medical center. Place that you're going to be bringing that out yeah, in that's, September. I don't think gone anywhere, so I'll have to check. Yeah, because those concerns would be something that's too bad we haven't started it sooner because they would be very far be Are these times that we can bring those things up to there? Yeah, the doctor be not going to be there. Okay. So, we, um, the staff, we would like to meet with Northern Health, and I don't think we have we got any issues with the RCP. Okay. <coughs> uh, 6.5, CR Cares, uh, just to thank you for the. Um, Move for information. Okay. 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 So moved, Your Worship. Seconder. Discussion. All in favor? Uh, the regional district uh, letter of support for our letter we sent out to the museum. Information or discussion? Move for information, Your Worship. So moved, Your Worship. Okay, seconder. Okay. Any discussion on it? All in favor? Zoning amendment bylaw number 648, 2017. For adoption two. So moved, Your Worship.
recommendation one is that the District of Tumbler Ridge State Police on law number 657-2017 be read first time. Okay, discussion? All in favor? Station two. Mr. Kirby? That the District of Tumbler Ridge Safe Premises Bylaw number 657 2017 be read a second time. Scott? Uh, discussion? All in favor? Recommendation number three. That the District of Tumble Ridge State Police is bylaw number 657-2017 be read a third time. Discussion. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> Waiting for the vote. Sorry about that. <laughs> Jumped <paper>. again. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to cut all the short break here. You gotta stick around. Question and answer period coming. I know, but I have that winter meeting at seven. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta go to the museum meeting. <laughs> Otherwise, I could ask you a tough one, maybe. <laughs> Museum meeting? Just going to a museum meeting. So we just had that. <laughs> Didn't we? We're all back here. Uh, we'll reconvene the meeting. Uh, try to do business. Uh, 8.1 sale of advertising policy. Council approves the disbursements of the revenues. Make the whole, we're doing the whole recommendation here? Yeah, yeah. That's what I took. Okay, so I just noticed on here, <clears throat> they, the Lions Club always have done the signs of ballparks. 
know they're a part of that or not part of that doing that. Um, Jeff could put through that and some of the funds used to go to the Lions Club now. I just noticed they're not on here. And it talks about the Paul Park community here as well. I'm just concerned why. I think the goal is to have the uh, ballparks uh, fixed by the time the the, the uh, policy in place by the time the ballpark advertising comes through. Right now, we're focusing on the on ice advertising. But um, to your point, if that money were to come in at this point, we would disperse it through the policy. So we could amend the policy to have just the ballpark funding go to the Lions, or we could amend the policy to have the ice money go to the Lions as well. It's been difficult because the way that this has been done in the past has been, as Councillor Kokoka said, community groups just go and fundraise themselves, get whatever money they can, and put it up either through by themselves or there uh, with our staff. So this transition period has uh, been challenging. So Council can direct that the ice advertising money goes to the Lions as well, the ballpark advertising go uh, or the lines be included in just the ballpark advertising, but I suspect by the time ballpark advertising comes around for the next season, we will have a, a formal policy in place. So, so just, just on that, my belief would be just a ballpark. Like, I'm not saying all the ballparks on it either. Like, I know it was, uh, how it was split up. Like you said, it was one individual, I believe, soliciting organizations or companies, and then he, that individual, was giving money up in whatever organizations they would do. I don't believe the lines would ever. Get anything in the ice. So I just think I just know I seen the ball dams in there, and that was my concern. Yeah. So will this here um, report be being amended for the um, the sale of advertising policy? That's correct. This is only an interim policy. So as it says in the recommendation, this is for the in ice advertising. We will have a full policy in place by the time the ball seasons come around. I cannot see this being an issue. Okay. If it is brought to an issue, it's to, as staff. We can either bring it to council or we'll find a way to work around it. I, I do not anticipate that being a problem, no. So now it will be the district that's approaching businesses requesting or, or advertising that there is a potential marketing signage available. That's and correct. So will that also include the signage at the arena, like there's already businesses up there? No? Because I think that was minor. Yeah, and so that's part of the issue we're having with this transition. So we're trying to transition to a point where what would happen is the district would do that advertising. We say you can come advertise with us. Council would set through policy where the money goes. But the groups would be upon themselves to go out and say, you know, please advertise on the ice or please advertise at the ball field where, wherever it is they want to go. So I don't want to give the impression that the district is going to be calling people soliciting donations because that's not what's going to happen. That would be left to the groups. But what would happen is now there would be a formal structure in place for when those donations come in. We'll have set rates, so we'll have a set rate for going on ice, we'll have a set rate for going on the boards, a set rate for getting up on the, the areas up there, and then that money would be dispersed to the groups through a, a, a percentage base. So that answers your question. Okay, so minor hockey would still be going out and recruiting advertising, but they would only get 35% of that. That's correct unless council was to adopt a policy where uh, whichever organization brings in the donation that's to keep 100% of it, it's, it would be up to council. But the way the policy is written now, it would be dispersed equally. So just in here, it's, it states that they're gonna use the business, list. so I'm assuming for the on ice, the district is gonna send out the business community. That's correct. That's my understanding. First come, first serve on spaces. Green Mountain Conference Center policy, GR48. Recommendation there. So moved, Your Worship. Seconder. Okay. Discuss. Discussion. All in favor? Okay, we've got a couple of 
travel was uh, 8.3, the mineral roundup uh, 2018. The recommendation is presented to worship. Move is presented. Seconder. Councilor Kirby. Have a discussion. All in favor? Your Worship. Yep. I just want to make clear that Council has approved your attendance at both of these conferences, but no other councillors have been identified. So as as of now, there would only be you who's approved to go if other councillors do want to go. Um, I believe in the reports there's okay. registration deadline, so I would take a, a look at that to make sure that either you uh, or that you get your request to travel to come in, and that can come through notice of motion at a later date. Okay. It is uh, it is nice to have um, somebody along along with those, with those uh, somebody who's got that portfolio. Great. That's case. Thank you, Worship. Just just for clarification, I took this on the basis that if councillors were interested in going, uh, then they had the go ahead to do that uh, and so forth is, is that that not the case council you could approve a general you could say uh, for example for the clean energy conference we approved three councillors to travel uh, you could say we approved one extra councillor to travel you could but as the recommendation reads right now um, it is just for mayor mcpherson and the second part of it is that council identifies and approves the travel <coughs> of other councillors but you can if you want provide that blanket where one more counselor can attend this. I guess the only question I have is why would we limit it? I mean, if counselors are interested in going, why don't we leave it open uh, and approve and and uh, individual counselors can can make it known that, yes, I'd like to attend it or not. Can, can we make that amendment to both of those? Or I would make just a separate motion that council approves uh, any counselor's attendance at both Clean Energy BC and uh, Mineral Roundup Conference. Can you make that motion? So moved. Second or counselor. Uh, any more discussion on it? All in favor? I would just draw council's attention to the registration deadline, so that will be your only um, limiting factor. Uh, 8.5, Northeast Resource uh, Resource Coalition. Yeah, this is uh, we've, um, we've asked to uh, promote the coalition uh, in other communities. And, uh, did you get them? Yes, I did, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long night, hasn't it? <laughs> yes, it has. Longer than we're used to. <laughs> anyway, it's yes, yeah, just for us to promote the um, coalition to the other communities and try to get uh, more membership to the coalition be a stronger and more business. That's what that's all about. So there is a recommendation. Councillor Kai. So moved. Seconder. Councillor Kirby. Uh, discussion on. Thank you, Worship. I actually won't be supporting the, the, the motion itself. I have no issues with uh, this being put on a meeting of Mr. Wall. But they were here as a delegation, and you have to bring up, and it's all talked about gas and, and, and oil and stuff like that. And you have to ask about mining, Mr. Councillor. I think the coalition isn't seeing all of us, so I won't be supporting the recommendation. Just, just, just as a little note to that, what you just said, that in the co form here, the coalition is actually. That supports uh, uh, social community. So they, they are starting to look at more. Sure. I appreciate that. Okay. And That's I strong. think us being part of the coalition brings to the table the experience of, of the mining community, the ups and downs. So it's our um, responsibility to to represent the mining sector. Um, one other question um, Could we move the council meeting? From the 18th to the 19th, or maybe the, the next Monday, 
Because this is, uh, like, I totally support the coalition. I think it's something really important. But we can maybe look at an alternate date for the council meeting that maybe makes it. The 19th, I don't know. The 19th would work. The 20th, we would be in Puskupi. The 27th is during UBCM, so I would suggest the only other date would be the 19th. I just worry about uh, possibly not having quorum in the same year. Uh, I got nothing on the 19th. Okay. So if we wanted to do that, that would work for me. <coughs> okay. So just maybe pass a motion moving canceling the meeting on the uh, 18th and scheduling one on the 19th. Yeah, you got a motion on the floor, so we'll vote on that. Okay. All in favor? So you want to make that motion? Sure. I'll make a motion. Oh, uh, okay. okay. That's okay. Stay gone. Stay okay. 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 Uh, motion to move the September 18th council meeting to Tuesday, September 19th. Seconder for that? Kirby, any discussion on it? All in favor? Oh, can we just make sure we put that out? I know I will, probably won't be in town. So can we just make sure that comes up the email as long as we have one council that's separate. I know I won't. All in favor? Opposed? Oh, so. <laughs> Was that opposed, Council? No. Okay. okay. <laughs> just a little bit. I feel like after four years, we'll get to the <laughs> 8.6 uh, temporary use permit uh, for Pacific Lot 3124, Lot 2324, Ridge Road. Recommendation? Councilor uh, Casey? Yes, sir. Decker? Councilor Kalka? Discussion? Councilor Scott? Um, it's um, a two year lease. I, to my um, looking at the dates, it looks like it's just one year. So I was just wondering why if you're going for a two-year lease, is that in case there's an extension request? Uh, the temporary use permit allows for two-year uh, agreements, and speaking with Vestas, we're entering into a two-year lease agreement because they had anticipated a year and a half that they're going to need. Both the district and Vestas have 180 day uh, no prejudice cancellation period that can be uh, leveled. So if Vestas or the district want to exit that early, it can happen. Okay, all in favor? Schedule of meetings. Anybody else? That, yeah, this is the way I was going to run it. No, I'm not doing that. So. Okay. Anybody else got anything? I've got one thing, and that was we were involved, uh, myself, Mr. Wall, and Mark Gavin uh, was involved in uh, the grand reopening of the CN rail line. We got a rail line trip up to the line. I thought it was going to go all the way to Prince George. I was a little disappointed. But we got to the mine anyway. It was a pretty good paper, but I suppose it was a nice, nice to see. So that is open. <laughs> um, anything 
anything else? Nothing. Um, there's no question asked, period. And we have a vote. resolution to vote to close. Favor. Oh, uh, we already had a break, so we can go ready to close. Yeah. 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 Yeah